In 2018, KQED conducted the first national survey of millennial science media habits to answer a wide range of important questions about our media consumption. How do people discover science? How does science media affect our political or religious values? Working with scientists from Yale and Texas Tech, they quantified science curiosity based on behavioral and self-reported measures and found that male millennials got the highest score on the scale compared to females or non-millennials. What's more, they found that teachers were the most influential to initial science interests among female millennials, but more male millennials reported being influenced by science fiction. Either way, the results were pretty clear that teachers and science fiction were the two main influencers of early science interest. And to me, this makes sense, for two general reasons. Science fiction books and movies are fun. They have engaging plot lines, charming celebrity actors and actresses, and they're often filled with insane acts of heroics. And the science behind these films and their discoveries bridges this gap of fantasy into something that seems a bit more plausible. And number two, they're just cool. Films like A Space Odyssey or Gattaca are, in my opinion, cinematic masterpieces. And the visuals behind these films just acts as another gateway into the incredible world of science. And if you don't think that movies about time travel or radioactive spiders or giant ants are plausible, I encourage you to keep listening as our guest, Professor David A. Kirby, talks about the difference between media credibility and plausibility. Dr. Kirby is an expert in where sciences and movies overlap, and has definitely been through a journey with science himself, earning a PhD in molecular genetics on the way. Today, we talk science in the movies. How it's evolved from the late 19th century to modern day comic book films, the changing representation of science and scientists as normal yet admirable people, and how both science and entertainment industries can help and harm each other. Dr. Kirby is such a down to earth person and so knowledgeable in so many films, so I really hope you guys enjoy this episode as much as I did. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Helix Show. Our guest today is Dr. David A. Kirby, Chair of the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies in the Liberal Arts at Cal Poly University. And Dr. Kirby actually received his PhD in Molecular Evolutionary Genetics from the University of Maryland. And since he has, and since he's transitioned to examining the symbiotic relationship of science and media, And before I hand it over to our guest, I do want to mention that he's the author of Lab Coats in Hollywood, which is a book about science consulting in a wide range of movies. Um, Dr. Kirby, thank you so much for joining me today on The Helix Show. And- Oh yeah, it's my pleasure, (laughs) glad to be here. Yeah, I I just want to get started with a bit of background. Um, Can we start, I guess, from the beginning, like childhood? to how you got to doing bench work and moving to being an advocate in this science communication realm. Yeah, yeah. so it, yeah, it is interesting that it does stem a little bit from childhood that, you know, when I was a kid, I loved um, the sort of Saturday morning uh, horror films that they would have. Um, and, you know, as back in the day, they would have these sort of special uh, horror shows like it, um, in Chicago, we had a, a, a character called Son of Sven Gulli who would host horror, chiller, thriller theater on Saturday mornings. Uh, and yeah, so just horror films, science fiction films. I was into uh, a lot of movies and overlap between the horror and the science fiction uh, often. Uh, but when I went on to school, um, you know, I liked science as a kid as well. Uh, I did well in science, I did well in math. And so, you know, that was sort of, at the time, everyone's just sort of said, hey, you better do something science-y. Uh, so um, I did bounce around a little bit in terms of my major at university. I started off in 
civil engineering and then moved to biology and then finally settled in uh, ecology and evolution at the University of Illinois in, in Champaign-Urbana. And <clears throat> so I got my degree in that. And, you know, the next step for me seemed to be to go to grad school because I still loved science, still wanted to do more science. Went to University of Maryland, as you mentioned, in College Park. Uh, did my degree in evolutionary genetics. Got a job right away at American University in Washington, D.C. And while there, I realized that, you know, I liked science a lot. You know, I still love science. But the doing of science was no longer, you know, something that I was as much interested in. And also, I became very interested in thinking about issues related to science in the media. So while I was at American University, I began a, a sort of science and film club where we would watch movies and then talk about the science in the movies afterward. Uh, and I wrote um, a paper about the film Gattaca uh, that had come out at that time and then thought, you know, this is something I enjoy. So if I want to do this full time and if I want to do it seriously, I need to get a little bit more training. And so I was able to get through the National Science Foundation uh, what they call a retraining postdoc. So they take scientists and retrain them to do things like uh, history of science, science communication, science and technology studies, and did that up at Cornell, which is where I began looking at those interactions between scientists and uh, Hollywood. Wow. So it's been quite a journey. <laughs> yeah, it has. It's... Um, yeah, it's taken uh, a little bit of, of uh, hard work to sort of get where I, I wanted to get. I mean, I often get people say, oh, I love, you know, I love what you do. This guy, how do I do it? So, well, take take work. <laughs> it was not the easiest uh, thing to do, uh, but, you know, it was stuff that I love. So it was well worth doing. And I'm curious, because you mentioned the retraining program. Do you still consider yourself a scientist, I guess, because you do, I think a lot of people kind of think that liberal arts isn't really a science. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you still consider yourself a scientist, someone well-versed in science? Yeah, well, I consider myself, yeah, I guess, it's, you know, once a scientist, always a scientist uh, <laughs> type of thing. And I, and I definitely consider myself to um be well versed in the ways of science at this point. Uh, I can't claim to be an expert on what I had trained in evolutionary genetics, even though I still follow it to to a degree. Um, so, you know, being a scientist doesn't necessarily mean that you are an expert yeah. in one very particular uh, type of topic. Um, but yeah, now I consider myself to be you know, an expert more in science communication than anything else. Um, so if I were to say, you know, if you ask me if I'm still a scientist, yeah, I'm still a scientist. Um, I'm no longer a practicing scientist, but I'm a scientist. But if you're asking me what my expertise is, it's no longer evolutionary genetics. It's now, yeah, science communication. Yeah, and that's that's really important, I think. And I that paper about Gallica you mentioned. I think I actually found that um, it is really interesting. I think it's also how most people get into science, as you mentioned, liking science fiction films or movies or books. I think that's one of the main ways that people kind of get drawn in. So definitely the work that you're doing is super fascinating. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the history of science in film and looking back, do you think there's one like film or one decade where science really started making big appearances on the big screen? Um, yeah, I could talk a little bit about the history. I mean, that, that, that sort of second question is an interesting one. I mean, I have a particular film that I see as important to contemporary science in movies. But if you go back to the history of cinema, um, I mean, one of the things that, you know, me and, and some of my colleagues have written about is how, you know, uh, cinema actually emerges out of scientific research, right? Yeah. So uh, you have people experimenting with ways of trying to study motion 
uh, and and movement. So there's a scientist, and my French is horrible, so I probably mispronounced his name, Etienne Jules Murray, um, who was interested in studying movement and motion and, you know, had to sort of figure out a way to do that with photography. And so by doing those sorts of things, he was able to uh, set up, um, yeah, a sort of proto motion uh, picture. Um, and so, you, you, you know, you have things like that where people were trying to study movement and that turned into the motion picture camera. Um, so, you know, it emerges out of science, so it's heavily tied to science. And even a lot of very early scientific films, you know, pe um, people wanted novelty with their early motion pictures, right? They didn't, uh, you know, stories are great and, you know, stories in terms of my research become very important. But early on, it was just this, the novelty, the sort of wow factor of seeing something on screen. Um, so science has its wow factor. And so you could just visualize certain scientific things. Like you could literally just take a camera, put it on a microscope, make a movie out of it. And then people would be like, oh my God, look at those enormous monsters, right? Because they're just looking at the, you know, bacteria or just um, human cells, things like that, or x-rays, uh, things of that sort of nature. So science was tied to cinema very, very early on. Um, in terms of what we might say is sort of representing or depicting various aspects of science. Um, again, very, very early you would get, you know, these science-based horror films, um, you know, you, you know, ones with Lon Chaney, uh, the, the silent film actor, you find a lot of those types of things. Or you think of Metropolis, you know, the Fritz Lang film from 1926. So you would still have a lot of science intersecting with uh, cinema. The idea of scientists working as consultants, I mean, it, it also goes back a long time, but in terms of it regularly happening, you know, you would get it sporadically and you'd get certainly certain films where uh, uh, whoever was, you know, maybe the director says, oh, I need a scientist to help me out on these things. So, you know, even starting in teens and 20s and 30s, you get scientists working on it but much more sporadically. Uh, I see, in terms of contemporary science and movies, Jurassic Park being the, the sort of big moment. Um, you know, it's the sort of watershed moment where, you know, you're making a film that is based in realism, right? And so I talk about a couple of different types of realism. There's the visual realism, right? How do those dinosaurs look? And they look like amazingly authentic dinosaurs running across the, street, the screen. Uh, but there's also what we call the scientific realism, right? So they look real, uh, but how authentic are they based on what it is that we know about uh, dinosaur science? Um, and, you know, for Jurassic Park, they brought a guy named Horner, who's at the Museum of the Rockies in Montana. Um, and they pay a lot of attention to scientific authenticity. You know, I mean, certainly some of the dinosaurs aren't as authentic as, you know, you can get people sort of picking them, you know, nitpicking them. But in general, they were both visually realistic and scientifically realistic. And Hollywood's a copycat culture, so people started to make science-based movies, and they couldn't sort of tease out the difference between the visual realism and the scientific realism. So they, they used both. Right. They decided, well, Jurassic Park was successful because of realism. We need both in order for ours to be, uh, you know, successful. And then you got films like Twister and Dante's Peak and Armageddon and all those sort of, you know, disaster films following in the wake of Jurassic Park in, in the 90s sort of led us up to the situation today. Yeah. And Jurassic Park, I think, was like one of those films that it's kind of really special in a lot of people. And a lot of people say that, oh, the first movie was so much better than like all of these remakes. Um, yeah. And Michael Crichton, I think he, he was also a scientist before he became an author. And I think that just having that scientific background kind of gives more credibility. And I think I actually found a paper that may, I think that you wrote, uh, maybe it was like an article about like, 
credibility versus plausibility. Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, Jurassic Park was kind of a movie that was both credible and plausible, but yeah. how important do you think scientific credibility needs to be to make these big Hollywood films? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, having that sort of scientific authenticity can add quite a bit to the plausibility for for people. Um, you know, when I was doing that research, we talked about the sort of historic elements of uh, science in, in movies. And one of the things I found were some, you know, some arguments that people were having in the 20s and the 30s. So moving into from silent film into sound film. And there was, uh, you know, sort of debates over what cinema was, you know, what defined good cinema, because you had, you know, cinema from across the globe, uh, essentially, right? So it wasn't just Hollywood as it is today, and you'll get Bollywood and you get your Hong Kong style. You know, you do get some dif differences, of course. Um, but back then it was really wide. Across Europe, you would have different styles of cinema. Uh, and the question was, what would, what would dominate? And one of the things that happened when the American style sort of won out is that Americans, um, they really want explanations for what they see on the screen, right? They want something plausible um, so that they can buy into what's happening. Whereas, you know, the Europeans didn't care all that much. Um, for them, cinema was about exploring, you know, psychology, characters, uh, larger themes. And so, you know, for them, it was like, okay, a magic ring, good enough. That gets that we get into the story that way. And, oh, that person had a dream. All right, that's fine. That's all we need. Americans wanted more something that would tie it to the real world and would give it heft. And using real science often does that. Um, or, you know, as we see with something like Star Trek, you can fake science. Um, <laughs> if people don't know any better, can get can tie them into it as well. Uh, although people are much more, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. people are much more savvy nowadays as being sort of film goers and TV viewers. Yeah, I think that's really interesting seeing how the trends change. Like, I, because when I think of like 1950s films, I think I don't really think of science fiction films. I think I think of like Marlon Brando or um, people like Vivian Leigh. Um, yeah. And then you move to, I think, and I do really want to talk about 2001 A Space Odyssey, yeah. um, but we can say that for later in the podcast as well. But I think after that, and also the introduction of superhero films, there started to be a lot more like attention to science. Um, yeah. And I did want to ask about superhero films because I kind of see their conception as being science-based, even just from the comics that was very tied with science. And why do you, do you think there's a reason why superheroes specifically are so, or people who write superhero films or watch superhero films are so obsessed with having some sort of scientific backstory behind them? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first I'll go back and mention, in terms of the 50s, the 50s had a lot of science fiction films. You know, it was sort of a golden age of, uh, what we call Cold War nuclear fear films, right? So like The Day the Earth Stood Still, um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that sort of stuff, which were, you know, Cold War films about <laughs> communist invasions or Godzilla nuclear nuclear destruction. Uh, but in terms of comic book films, um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things is that, you know, Kevin Feige, who is the sort of... Uh, you know, overlord of, <laughs> you know, comic book films for Marvel uh, at Disney. Um, when they were ver first working on these, he was, he wanted there to be scientific integrity for these comic book films. And some of it is you're coming out of, um, you know, a time with the, the first, the Batman films of Tim Burton where it had gotten very campy again, right? And so uh, they wanted to avoid that sort of campiness element, right? Because you could easily see how 
with comic book films if they're not that tied to reality you know the tipping point always sort of starts to, you know it starts to move and then all of a sudden you've got you know your your batman and robin style film right so that was going to help ground it going to keep it a little bit more realistic um make it give it a little bit of plausibility right because you're talking about you know people who don't exist spiders. doing things yeah. yeah and um so there was that sort of element that they wanted and starting around iron man um, a new organization had um, sprung up called the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is run by the National Academy of Sciences. And the Science and Entertainment Exchange uh, decided that they were going to be uh, a sort of service where they would you know, put filmmakers and TV producers and computer game producers in touch with scientists to help add some scientific authenticity or integrity to their films. Uh, and just from the from the get go, they were able to work with a, a guy, a physicist who's done a lot of work with Marvel films, kind of Sean Carroll. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then they just established the relationship. So all the Marvel films have science behind them. And once you once you sort of uh, establish what you know your shared universe as being based on scientific integrity then all the films have to do that, right? Yeah. So Doctor Strange has to, even though he's some metaphysical, supernatural... Wizard. <laughs> wizard, yeah. right? If you if you watch it, it's all sort of try, tries to be grounded within some scientific explanations as to how he has his powers and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, they, they started very early with that. Uh, and so all the films have had science consultants trying to explain what the possible science is uh, yeah. for all these superpowers. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why things like Marvel or comic books where you kind of think of the stereotypical geek kind of person who's consuming the media. Now, like Endgame or Infinity War, those movies are kind of just a cultural thing that kind of everyone watches. And I think a big part yeah. of that can be attributed to like this grounding science and also... Just it's very cool. I think. <laughs> um, I think the advisor for Amazing Spider-Man, uh, Kalios, like he was talking yeah. about how the most unrealistic thing in these movies are just the long monologues that they give off, <laughs> and I, I I do think that's really true. Uh, I was wondering, do you think there's any dangers in science films perpetuating kind of science myths or? I know you already talked about how a film doesn't really have to be too scientifically credible to be plausible, but for example, in um, Lucy, like using 10% of your brain, yeah, things like yeah. that, what do you think? Do you think that's misinformation or just Hollywood? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. Um, yeah, I think try to, in my research, think about the context of the, the production as well, right? So, you know, I, I talk about the idea that, well, scientific experts have scientific expertise. That's what they're bringing on, you know, onto a set. But filmmakers, they have what we can call entertainment expertise, right? So they will know better than anyone else what will make a film entertaining and whether or not, they're, you know, the scientific authenticity will uh, ruin that at some level. But by the same token, I do think there are times where, you know, scientific integrity can be uh, an issue. And you mentioned one of them, Lucy, the 10% brain myth. You know, I think that's a very problematic uh, idea that's been perpetuated through yeah, movies. I mean, you know, um, the director of, of Lucy has sort of gone on record saying he doesn't care that you know that it's not scientifically accurate he's he's not really done much right this Luc Besson he's pretty much said I, I don't care about scientific accuracy or authenticity you know it's you know like we talked about earlier he's coming from a sort of European approach to, to movies he's not as much interested in uh the plausibility elements and there are other things you know I, 
if it if it tips over into medical um, issues, that can be a problem, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, in general, it, it probably doesn't matter. Some of the stuff, you know, so we talked about Jurassic Park. You know, the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park is totally inaccurate. Yeah. And you know, okay, so people, little kids, can go away knowing that it's inaccurate. If we're talking about the ways in which that movie impacted science, that that had very little impact. It really was more the depiction of genetic engineering, right? And that was the major impact that film had on on science. So I like to think of it as, you know, there, there's that that line in Animal Farm, right? Some animals are more equal than others. Yeah. And so when we're talking about facts in movies, I always think that well, some facts are more equal than <laughs> others, right? That It'd be great if everything was totally 100% accurate, um, but if it's something like uh, the dinosaurs, it's not as problematic as if it's something medically related. Um, so, for example, the movie Assassin's Creed is one I like to talk about because in there they have, a, you know, it perpetuates a very pernicious myth that, you know, violence and criminality are inherited, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems, you know, just sort of not a problem in the context of the movie because, oh, they're trying to, that's how this guy's related to his father. But, you know, if you really think about it, that's a very um, devastating type of thing to, you know, to, to promote because then if you're talking about social programs to try and help people with, you know, if if you just say, oh, but it's all inherited, so what's the use? You know, that, that can be a very much a problem. So it's a sort of yes and no type, type of answer that, yeah, it can be problematic, especially we're talking about health, but oftentimes it's not going to be that much of an issue. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, I think it is such a big spectrum of opinions and even political ideologies that can go into it. And there is, I think, a lot of people who are kind of fans of science or fans of comics, they'll really, they'll sit down on like their online forums and they'll write about how scientifically mm -hmm. inaccurate like these movies are. But also there is, it is like a Hollywood film. Um, yeah, yeah th and there's fun to be had in that. I mean, I, when I was initially writing and writing the book, you know, I, I kind of, made lots of jabs and I call it the sort of real science of, and, you know, like, Oh, how come you're, you know, these people are being pedantic and they're missing out on the idea of what these movies are meant for. There's entertainment, but then you began to realize that, well, no, people actually have fun with it. Right. I mean, it could be a fun activity for people who have scientific knowledge to sort of go through and, and, and you know, and do that sort of nitpicking. Um, so although I think they need to, you know, pay more attention to, you know, how film actually works so that you can understand why some things are inaccurate. Now I'm just sort of like, yeah, if it's fun for you to do that, then yeah, go ahead and do it. Yeah. And that's funny because I think my chemistry teacher, whenever you show the movie in class, he would kind of pause every five minutes and just say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong. Or <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a scene from like Zoolander he showed us where they're at a gas station and they oh, like yeah. the whole, he was like, this is like an example of, he would not like me forgetting what it was an example of. <laughs> what was he talking about? He was talking about combustible gases. And yeah, yeah. Um, I think that can be really valuable, even in films like Zoolander, where science isn't really a main role. Yeah. And that's also something that I want to talk about, because I think some films, science is really essential to the plot line, like mm -hmm. for Gattaca or Jurassic Park or 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's very science based. And then I think in some other films, it's kind of just more as like an add on or it's just like an accessory and or even films like superhero films like uh, Endgame or Marvel. I think they kind of just a lot of times they'll kind of just throw in these words. There's the famous quote from like Tony Stark where he kind of says like, quantum fluctuation messes with the Planck scale, which figures <laughs> the doik proposition. And none of that 
make sense, but it's yeah. just, so do you think there's like, do, what what's the value of kind of, kind of having these films that aren't science based, but they kind of just throw in these terms? Do you think it makes it more confusing for science educators, or is it does it get people interested so people can go home and search it up? Yeah, it gets people interested, and in a certain sense, there's also the idea of you know science. I often say science is, is not just a bunch of facts in a textbook, right? Science is a much larger cultural entity. Um, including, you know, scientists are part of science. So, you know, Tony Stark and Bruce Banner in those Marvel films, you know, science is part of their character, right? Part of their character is that they're going to be talking about scientific ideas that everyone else is not going to know about, right? So it's just like, oh, well, there goes Tony and, and Bruce again, you know, talk about these crazy ideas that you know, we don't understand. Um, I think there is even one scene where they play off of Captain America with with that sort of idea. Um, so, yeah, that, that you know, science in that case is almost for character development, right? Um, and science can you know be useful in other ways that aren't necessarily about throwing around facts. It's a, it can set the context for uh, a particular movie or a plot. Um, and yeah, there are films where it's a sort of maybe possibly secondary type of element um, that if you'd gotten rid of, you know, wouldn't have necessarily ch um, changed the film too much. But at some level, you could argue, well, they're using it to, um, you know, set a particular context and then it becomes important, right? So it becomes important that they you know, are, are trying to do something for NASA as opposed to trying to do something for the FBI, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a storytelling element that science can add that can be very interesting, right? Because science itself is interesting. And so when you're using it for storytelling, it can, you know, it can help you with the themes that you want to do as well. I mean, I talk about often the movie Hidden Figures, yeah. right? It's based on a, a, a real people and, and, a, and a, a nonfiction book. But, you know, I, I often say that movie is not about science, right? Its theme is about discrimination, right? Especially discrimination against African-American women in the 50s and 60s, right? Who, you know, not just face one form of discrimination, but multiple forms of discrimination. Um, and why that film and story is successful uh, is because it is set at NASA, right? A scientific organization. And when you're talking science, science is supposed to be totally objective, right? Science is the most objective cultural activity that humans take part of. And, you know, if, you know, if there was one place where you shouldn't face discrimination, it would be at NASA. And so it or at least foregrounds the discrimination against the women because technically, if you know you should have get a job at NASA, you're good enough. You're good enough. You get a job there, and so that's why the setting plays a, you know an important role because they could have made the film with other types of women, African American women trying to do other things in the fifties and sixties. Oops, sorry, cat in the way. Um. But by having it as science, you lay out the idea that, yeah, people understand science is, obje is objective. And if it's discriminating, well, then that's a problem. And I think that's also something we see with kind of dystopian science fiction books is the background of the scientific universe is kind of, although it's science based, it's also used to accentuate certain aspects of characters like um, maybe Brave New World or uh, the Foundation Trilogy. It's very, it kind of highlights, it ridicules like how robots can't become politicians and things like yeah. this. Um, and I, I think another thing about Hidden Figures versus films like The Martian, I think The Martian, it gets a lot of praise because it seems a lot more science discovery based. It's focused on 
the actual scientific process and the diversity in that film, which is something I want to talk about. But um, it's more like there's Asian scientists and there's um, African American scientists, but they're not. They're not. That's not. They're not identified by their race or ethnicity. They're just scientists, and they're there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing that the Martian did. So I guess can we talk a bit about diversity in the movies? Obviously, there's a long yeah. way to go. <laughs> um, but how do you think that has changed over the years? Yeah, I mean, it's changed. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, as you mentioned, like, you know, if you go back to the 50s, and 60s and 70s and even 80s. Yeah, it's pretty much your middle aged white man who is the, the, you know, is going to be the scientist in your in your film. And if not, if it's the woman then she's just the love interest, even if she's a, a, a scientist. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a classic. Uh, movie called Them from the 1950s about giant ants. Essentially, it's nuclear bombs, you know, lead to gigantic ants running around Los Angeles. Um, and the main scientist character, you know, comes to meet the sheriff. Um, and, you know, she, he has a woman in tow and the scientist, or the sheriff is, you know, wants to know her name and she's like i'm dr jones and it's like oh you're too pretty to be a doctor you know so even there was a lot of that sort of stuff right she essentially became the love interest really it's all she, all she had but again through starting with jurassic park right you have dr ellie sattler um you start to get a lot more i mean it wasn't instantaneous but you get a lot of more uh different types of people playing scientists in, in these movies. Yeah, I mean, The Martian is an interesting example that it has a lot of scientific diverse, or diversity, but yet yeah, you're spending most of your time again with the you know middle-aged white guy, <laughs> pretty much. Um, which was nice about a film like Gravity, right, with Sandra Bullock, where you know it's it's almost entirely spent with her uh, on, on there. So yeah, it is it is getting different. I mean, think about a, a film like Big Hero Six, right? Yeah. Um, and things like hidden hidden figures or yeah, interstellar, you're getting a lot more. So it, it's getting it's getting much better uh along those lines. Although there still is a little bit of a ways to go in terms of representation. Yeah, and I think this is also just a global thing. There has always been female scientists, even in Newton's time, I guess, but we're it, even in just the scientific community, a lot of these female scientists don't get recognized, like Catherine Johnson or Jocelyn Bell, or uh, um, yeah. and I think it also is just it shows in the movies, and hopefully that's something that uh, will change. But I don't think that necessarily takes away from these great um, films. Um, I also want to uh, there's this movie called Lorenzo's Oil. Mm -hmm. I think um, that represents parents as scientists or people who necessarily don't necessarily have a degree in anything who still can be scientists. And I wanted to talk kind of about the portrayal of a scientist or a genius. I think like movies like Goodwill Hunting um, or A Beautiful Mind kind of show a troubled scientist protagonist. Yeah. Although Goodwill Hunting, I'm not sure if you would call Matt Damon like a scientist in a sense. But then you get kind of films like um, Apollo 13 and yeah. the Martian or it's kind of and you see a team effort which is also a thing in science I feel like it can be very individualized very you have to win the Nobel Prize or um, honor based kind of pride ego based almost and kind of showing it as a team effort do you are there any examples of any films that you think also do this yeah with the sort of team element as opposed to the individual yeah. element um, oh, I'd have to think about it uh, a little bit. I mean, you know, movies as narratives, you tend to, you know, you can have your ensemble cast, like your Robert Altman films, yeah. but especially any that feature science, like science fiction, you, you get people generally want a hero that they could follow that one person. So even though there are sort of teams, um, 
it's almost always that sort of singular uh, scientist. Uh, there's a movie called Sunshine. Uh, came out in 2008, I want to say. Um, it, it was made by Danny Boyle. It it didn't make a lot of money. I think they marketed it wrong. It's since grown to have uh, a following. There's a lot of people who who you know have sort of latched on to that film. And there, I would say it's, it's much more team based. Um, Technically, Killian Murphy might be considered the one protagonist, but he's not shown as the, the main hero mo- all the time. So, yeah, Sunshine is probably a good example of that. Okay. I think it's also just the portrayal of scientists as kind of out of the ordinary. I think geniuses who are out of the ordinary, which honestly, some scientists are probably very out of the ordinary. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think Newton or Einstein or Feynman, those people were kind of normal. But yeah. I think there's thousands of scientists who do work every day that are normal people. Um, and they are making good discoveries. And I think that's why I like films like The Martian. I feel like the protagonist, middle-aged white guy, he's still kind of normal. He seems like he would live a balanced life. So yeah. I think that's also something that drew me to films like that. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, with, I mean, one of the things with with a lot of these movies, you know, when you had those stereotypes, especially the mad scientist stereotype, I mean, that was just what filmmakers knew, right? It was like a comedic trope. They wanted scientists. Like, oh, well, it's mad scientist, that's the way to go. Put them in a lab coat, make them be kind of kind of crazy. And I think this is an, an offshoot of having more scientists work as consultants on movies is is much more difficult to get those types of, you know, crazy stereotypes in there because you're asking a scientist for help on your script, you know, on the set, uh, and yet you're portraying scientists as crazy people. Right. So, you know, there's lots of examples of scientists going through the scripts and being like, you got to remove that. You, you know, well, we can't, you know, we shouldn't be acting like that um, because, you're right, scientists are just regular people like anyone. Right. And they have the same daily concerns as everyone. Got to take out the trash. Got to take the kids to school. Right. Got to walk the dog. I mean, they're, they're just people, basically. Yeah. yeah. And in the past, uh, in one of the past interviews I did, I asked um, the guests. Uh, Dr. Gary Shustak about his like biggest his least favorite part of his job and he was just like the interpersonal stuff is always the least favorite part (laughs) Um, so I think it is um it those movies are really and science consultants are doing some really incredible work and I guess this segues kind of well into your book uh lab coats in hollywood so what was kind of the process of doing research for these films did you have specific films you wanted to talk about and um after like choosing them did you kind of look into what consulting went in yeah well certainly at the time i mean there was definitely films like jurassic park to talk to people uh, about um, so, Jurassic Park it w- would be one. I was like, yeah, I gotta have Jurassic Park in there. Um, but really, you know, this a lot of the research took place before, not before the internet, but before the web became so ever present, and you know, before internet movie database existed. I mean, I had to go through. You know, you have these books. Um, the AFI, the American Film Institute, used to have these big, big red books. I think I've got one back here. And <laughs> kind of see them back there. Oh, wow. Yeah. They, you know, and they had these enormous books with every film ever made that you go through, look at cast and crew and gives you summaries of what happened. And so I had to do that basically to sort wow. of find where any science consultants might have worked. And, you know, doing a lot of research like that. I mean, the internet was still around, so I would try and Google uh, things, but it was also uh, back before. You know, nowadays, if a scientist works as a consultant on a film, they're excited about it, and they'll go out on the press tour and they'll tell everyone they know I worked on that <laughs> film. But for a long time, no, they wouldn't, right? They, so it was really hard to find 
you know, nowadays, if, if my book hadn't been written and I could do it now, it would be so much easier um, to get all the scientists that you need. Uh, so back then, it was a little bit more difficult to figure out who to talk to. Jurassic Park, yeah, that one was easier because Jack Horner was involved in all the press for that stuff as well. Um, yeah, and then just people would tell me names. I could get, get it from that way uh, as well. Or like you mentioned, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey, you know, that, you know, for a long time, people talked about it as the most scientifically accurate film ever made. Yeah, and I think Arthur C. Clarke was a very, I think a lot of people knew about him too. Um, yeah, and that also just makes me appreciate the internet a lot more for people like me. Uh, I think yeah. in the film, like Lorenzo's Oil, the parents, they actually have to go to the library and they have to get everything printed out and like copied and... Um, yeah. just watching that and now thinking okay i can just google this keyword it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um and i did want to talk a bit about uh 2001 a space odyssey i think just the visuals of that film for being made in like late 1960s it's incredible and i didn't actually know that like i never knew that it was just kind of projected images or all of these special effects that went in before there were CGI um, is incredible. But can we talk about, I guess, more about the science consulting that went into that? Was the science yeah. consulting more based for the plot or was it for all those scientifically accurate like visuals? Um, or yeah, was it I mean, the- yeah, it was uh, lonely. In there, I might settle them down. Um, it was for everything, right? I mean, the you know they they wanted the visuals to be just as authentic as any of the content, and you know, for that film, that film has a lot of pretty minimal dialogue in general. Uh, in any case, and for them, it was much more important to make sure that the spacesuits and, and depictions of space, all of that were, you know, was much more scientifically authentic uh, than even the dialogue was uh, at times. So, you know, they brought in, you know, Ordway and the guy named Harry Lang as their science. These people worked at NASA throughout the 60s and were very important in developing the technology that was seen in you know the Apollo missions, right? The Apollo Eleven mission to the moon. So they were bringing that sort of information with them, and Kubrick was well known for his attention to detail, right? <laughs> and I think I have a quote in the book where Kubrick says, "You know it. You know everything comes out. You know the the the." major themes come out only because you have this real detailed look at, at, at things. And so, you know, they spent three years gathering research information um, in order to portray it as authentic as they possibly could. And, you know, some of this is they were going against, you know, from the, starting in the 50s, you had a, just an enormous number of films depicting space travel, even, you know, even though most of them were sort of science fiction horror films. And so you had the vision of the sort of shiny spaceships, right? Metallic. Everyone would have assumed these things would have been all metallic. And so they were fighting against those depictions, right? Yeah. And so by making their spaceship, you know, this sort of white, right? The ceramic tile uh, white, you know, they had to make sure everything was authentic so that people weren't just like, what? That's not the way spaceships look. You know, where's the metallic? You know, it should be shiny chrome. Um, So it was a lot about the visuals and the scientific elements. You know, they got into that uh, as well. What most people forget about 2001 is that there's also a very... The earliest part is set in sort of prehistoric times, right? Yeah. The idea of of these cave people first learning how to use tools. Yeah. So they brought in anthropologists to oh. to talk about that stuff as well. So it wasn't just the space stuff. Um, 
yeah, Kubrick shot for, you know, a hundred percent accuracy if he could. Yeah. And that first, the Dawn of Man like sequence that I was really surprised to learn that was like a projected that they weren't actually like in a desert or anything. I think that's one yeah. of the most famous transitions in film history with the oh, drone. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but that movie, I think when I first watched it, it was really confusing, like most <laughs> of Kubrick's films to me. Um, yeah. But his precision to detail is almost. I'm not even like I feel like it's Kubrick is kind of this mad scientist trope where I don't yeah. know how many people would actually pay it. He probably did thousands of things that still go undiscovered. Um oh, although yeah. now people are people are really commending him for his work or even in um a clockwork orange, like he I think the actor who plays uh Alex, like he got his eye like ripped from that like so yeah. I think he kind of goes down in like <laughs> film history as a crazy scientist director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's 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 the the stereotype of the mad mad director. Yeah, but um, yeah. I guess I know it's getting close to an hour. And I respect your time. I have like some more questions, but I guess kind of my final closing question about film specifically is. Do you think, I know we've talked a lot about how science influences what shows up in the movies, but how do the movies really influence what goes back and what scientists like do? And on that note, do you have any predictions for the future of science in film? Like, do you have any topics that you think will be um, making appearances? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, one thing, like I said, the movies influence science the, the most major way is through making people aware of particular issues because you, you know i talk about this in other you know in my science and media class right that public attention is a resource right I and mean, that's why people spend millions of dollars on pr yeah. is you need people to actually pay attention and know about you and getting so that you know getting your science into a Hollywood movie that's the best PR you could ever hope for right because now people are talking about it now there's newspaper people magazine people television people they all want to talk to you yeah. about your particular science and you're the you're the expert on it um so yeah that sort of raising public awareness is certainly a major one you know how, how the depictions happen especially for organizations can have an impact right I mean NASA, that's why they work on all these films. They want, to, they want to shape their institution's image, right? So they want to shape how it is that people think about NASA as an organization. Right? Because if we think about it, justifying NASA, in some ways it's really hard, right? Yeah. You know, we, people love the idea of going in outer space. We love the, you know, you know the, the astronauts are clearly heroes. But by the same token, if you want to cut things, what, what, you know, how, what is it doing for us? You know, it's doing stuff, but it's hard to explain how it's doing stuff. So to have these movies is a great way to, in the public's mind, think, yeah, NASA is essential. NASA saves the world. You know, NASA does more than just, you know, send, you know, rockets into space. So there's that. Um, there's also the idea of technological development. So a lot of scientists who work on these films, you know, they want, they have a particular technological idea and they want that idea to be turned into reality, right? So um, a film like Minority Report has this called gestural interface where Tom Cruise's character moves things around on the screen with his hands. Um, and the scientist who worked on that movie, they, you know, he used that opportunity to develop this interface. Mm -hmm. And because of the movie, people started calling him saying, is that real? If it's not real, can I give you some money to make it real? <laughs> um, or a movie, like I mentioned, Big Hero 6, you know, Betamax, the sort of breakout, sorry, Bay, Baymax, yeah. the, the breakout star, you know, the, the soft, cuddly robot. I mean, the scientist who worked on that film as consultants they all want to make uh, that soft medical robot a reality. 
All right, so you can go online now and, and find their, you know, make Bay, Baymax real website, you know, because essentially they wanted to get people excited about the idea of those uh, types of things. So yeah, lots of ways in which uh, movies can actually impact science. Yeah, it's it's funny because when I actually try to find people to come on this podcast, sometimes I just think of movies that I've watched to think of cool topics. Like Uh I think for Snowpiercer, after watching Snowpiercer, I was like, oh, what's solar geoengineering? Maybe I should look. Yeah, yeah, so because as someone who doesn't know that much about a lot of these fields, it's I think that's kind of an easy gateway. Um, But I did want to kind of close this podcast off with some questions that I ask all of my guests, if you have the time. Um, Uh And there's quite a lot of them. So, Um, But one is, can you share one of your biggest regrets as a student, whether it be in high school or college or, yeah. Yeah. um, I have a a number of of regrets uh, (laughs) off, off of this. One was just take notes on everything. And I don't mean just when you're in lecture listening to, but every, you know, all your ideas or or anything like that, because you think you're going to remember it, but you don't remember it. And it wasn't until, you know, really I was, you know, a professor when I really, you know, when I was like, I got to start writing this stuff down, you know, otherwise I'm going to forget everything. Um, Yeah. So that was certainly one thing. Uh, the second regret, you know, when I when I got to university at the University of Illinois, you know, I was a, a pretty smart guy. I did well in high school, and I didn't have to study very much in in high school. Um, but when you try to apply that at university, it doesn't work as well. So even if you're a smart person, you do have to study. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you have to read read your books and stuff. Um, so yeah, those I guess would be two, two of my regrets. Yeah, and I think that's really, really, really great advice for our listeners. Um, and these are some more rapid fire questions. So, if you could have one snack food or food for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> ah, um, wow, that's a great question. I, I'm, you know, I'm assuming most people might mention pizza, like they're a Ninja Turtle. <laughs> Um, but a snack food, uh, I'm partial to the, to the candy Twizzlers. Oh, so yeah, I guess that would be something, although that would not be very healthy. (laughs) I think we've gotten, um, chocolate cake with white frosting and then Parmesan goldfish and Doritos. (laughs) I don't, yeah. So it's, it's been, it's been on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Twizzlers. Also. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite musician or genre of music? Oh, yeah, good question. I mean, I like a lot of genres of music. Um, you know, I really got into what was called industrial dance music. So it was, you know, this is back in the day. So bands like, you know, Skinny Puppy and Front 242 and Ministry. Bands like that um, I really gotten into. Um, but since then, you know, yeah, a lot of uh, rock music, um, yeah, what we, what we used to call alternative rock music. Uh, so, yeah, pretty wide, wide spectrum. <laughs> and this is something I usually ask, but I think you'd be an expert on this favorite book or movie. <laughs> ah, that's a good good question. Um well, people always ask me that with sort of science movies. <laughs> but it doesn't and, have know, to be. 2001 is certainly one. Contact would be uh, another. Uh, I really liked Arrival, uh, the movie. Oh, yeah. That was one of my favorite movies of the last couple of years, uh, for sure. Um, you know, outside of science, there's a movie called The Third Man that has uh, Orson Welles in it mm-hmm. um, and Zither music. Uh it's a it's a great film. It's a, it's a very it's an excellent thriller, but it's also very deeply thematic um, in terms of yeah what what makes a hero type of thing. So uh, yeah, um, DC or Marvel? Uh, uh, both, uh, I would say. I mean, I, I I like 
yeah, I like characters from both. But if I pick a favorite character, it's going to be the Hulk. Oh, um, it's always my favorite. The the smart Hulk, Professor Hulk, uh, or just yeah, the smart uh, uh, going through the the gamut of yeah, the smart Hulk, Red <laughs> Hulk, you know, yeah. all the all the various Hulks I like. Um, so that would probably tip me towards Marvel yeah. a little bit because I uh, yeah, I like Captain America as well. But I always you know growing up, I liked Batman and Superman and, oh, and right. Wonder Woman a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I think DC kind of just got ruined with Suicide Squad for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the movies aren't very good yeah. um, at all. But as characters, yeah. Uh, growing up, I always liked them. Yeah. And if you had unlimited time, money, resources, everything, what's one burning question about the world you'd want to answer? Oh. <laughs> well. The you know the science communication expert in me, um, and given that we're in a pandemic where we have solutions that no one wants to use, like wearing masks and vaccines, uh, you know, if I could answer, you know, in terms of the science of science communication, how do we break through and get people to, in terms of risk communication, to realize certain risks and certain behaviors. Right. Why do we have anti-vaxxers, you know, or, or even things like, you know, the idea of evolution, things like that. So from science communication perspective, you know, people are looking into these questions, but still kind of up in the air. You know, how can we reach these people? Yeah, it's such a multidisciplinary approach, I think, because you have to approach it from the psychology and just the religious ideology, the ethics of everything, the science behind it. And I do wonder, like, maybe after this pandemic, um, if there will be a lot of movies about the COVID-19 pandemic and just virology in general. Um, Yeah, yeah. Let's hope so. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I just want to end off. Uh, where can our listeners find your amazing work? Um, are there any like websites um, or places or places they can yeah, buy I mean, your they book? Can go to, yeah, they can go to my website at Cal Poly um, and, and look me up. I mean, I do have a website. Uh, well, there, the, the, a website with some of my former colleagues at Manchester called the Science and Entertainment Lab. And that has a bunch of information about us. Uh, I do have a website, davidakirby.com, but it's it it was up and running, but now I had to move it. I haven't yeah. had a chance to get it all back together. Uh, but certainly at my Cal Poly website or the Science and Entertainment Lab. Thank you so much for listening to The Helix Show. If you're enjoying this podcast, please, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or follow our show on Spotify. It would really help us out. And please drop a comment here on YouTube or shoot me an email at chris at helixscience.org to let me know any questions, comments, or future episode ideas. Any feedback is greatly appreciated.